Okay, I think it's uh, our time to start. Uh, I'll begin by introducing myself very briefly. My name is Anya Irmakova, and I'm a conservation biologist and research consultant based in London. I uh, uh, have a very strong interest in peyote, and I uh, did a research project in Texas two years ago uh, with the Cactus Conservation Institute, and I'm a board member of the Cactus Conservation Institute and a member of Chakruna Council for Protection of Sacred Plants. Uh, but my also I have a background in psychiatry, so uh, for me it's uh, uh, absolutely amazing to moderate uh, Mike Jay's uh, talk because he has interests that are very, very, very aligned. Uh, so and let me introduce Mike now. Uh, Mike Jay is an author, a cultural historian and curator, and he's written widely about a broad spectrum of all sorts of topics about the history and culture of psych psychoactive plants and uh, fungi, as well as madness, asylum. Uh, uh, he is the author of High Society, Might Alter in Drugs. And uh, he also uh, curated several exhibitions, amongst them uh, some in Welcome Collection in London and uh, across the world. And I, most, his most recent book is called Mescaline, A Global History of First Psychedelics, which traces traditional cultures of mescaline containing cacti, their investigation of Western science in the 19th century and subsequent use of mescaline in modern art, science, medicine, and spirituality. Uh, he is also uh, affiliated at the Center for Health and Humanities at University College London. Uh, I will post uh, in the chat the link to uh, other books by Mike, and I want to draw your attention that uh, his wonderful book about mescaline has just came out in paperback, and I encourage everyone to read it. It's incredibly comprehensive, informative, and nuanced with this complicated topic. And uh, with this, over to you, Mike. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Anya. And... Uh... Thank you also to uh, to Bea, to Josh, to Karen, to everyone at SEA. And uh, I'm moving over to some images. So uh, great, I can't see you, but I hope you can see me and I hope you can see my PowerPoint. Um, is that good, Anya? Shall I go? Okay, uh, before I start, I will be... Uh... Anya popped off, but it looks great, Mike. Sorry? Anya, Anya popped off screen, but I'm just telling you that it looks good. You're good. Okay, you can hear me. We can hear you in the PowerPoint. Yeah. looks great. Great. Well, before I start, I will be uh, speaking about and uh, showing images of uh, Native American history, particularly the Comanches. So my gratitude goes out to Sia the Mother Church and the history keepers of the Comanche Nation for their permission to relate the story of their people, Uda. I'd like to tell two parallel stories which unfolded at the same time, the late 19th century, and in the same country, the USA, but in two very different worlds. In what is now remembered as the Wild West, the Native American population was being held in forced captivity in the reservations allocated to them after the Indian Wars. At the same time, in the cities of the East Coast and the Great Lakes, the Electric Age was in full swing and with it, the beginning of the era of modern industrial pharmacy. The story that links these two worlds is that of peyote, a small insignificant looking cactus containing among other things, a powerful alkaloid compound mescaline, the first example known to science of what we now call a psychedelic. During the 1880s and 1890s, the Plains tribes adopted peyote as a medicine and as the central sacrament in the new religion that emerged from their struggle for survival as a people. At the same time, it came to the attention of Western medical science and was developed into a pharmaceutical product. In the first case, it thrived, spread, and remains deeply rooted in Native American healing practices to this day. In the second, it failed to find a market and disappeared from the pharmacopoeia. I want to ask what these parallel stories tell us about the differences between indigenous and Western concepts of medicine. And as 21st century clinical practice turns its attention and hopes to psychedelic therapies, 
whether and how they might be successfully integrated into it. The trade in the peyote cactus is ancient, established in pre-Hispanic times across its natural habitats, the mountains and high desert scrub of northern Mexico, extending across the Rio Grande into pockets of modern day Texas. Fresh buttons of the heads are heavy and bruise and spoil easily, but once dried, simply by uh, stringing them up in the desert sun, they're light, easy to transport and retain their potency for years, even decades. By the mid 19th century, a trading network was well established on both sides of the Rio Grande. And after 1845, when the northern side became part of Texas and the USA, harvesting intensified in the parched plains and hillsides around the city of Laredo that are still referred to as the Peyote Gardens. The Texas Peyote Gardens drew visitors from many tribal groups across the Southwest USA and became a center for exchange with the traditional cultures of Mexico. Peyote rarely changed hands for money. It provided the impetus for a barter economy in which a constellation of goods, artifacts, ideas and practices circulated. By the 1870s, the trade was partially monetized by local Hispanic traders known as peyoteros, who typically sold to visitors from more distant tribes without local connections. After the Texas-Mexico Railroad opened in 1881, trains stopping at the local stations were regularly filled with barrels of dried peyote for transport to Laredo and on as far as Oklahoma. In 1887, a Texan doctor and crusading medical journalist named John Raleigh Briggs published an article in the medical register on muscal buttons, as he called them, a Mexican fruit with possible medicinal virtues. He had heard that Indians were in the habit of eating six or ten of these buttons, after which they lapsed into unconsciousness and remained thus, he said, for two or three days. On awakening, they related many remarkable adventures in the spirit world and the return to the prairies of innumerable herds of buffalo and wild horses. Briggs procured some buttons from a Mexican peyotero and ate a third of one, which he assumed would be a tiny dose, but the effects were violent and rapid. His heart raced and breathing became difficult, convinced he was about to die. He rushed to a doctor friend who revived him with ammonia and whiskey. The plant was, he concluded, well worth the trouble to investigate. In its potent physiological and psychoactive properties, he wrote, I know of nothing like it except opium and cocaine. Briggs' article was reprinted in the Druggist's Bulletin the following month and drew an immediate inquiry from George S. Davis, the flamboyant and energetic general man manager of the Detroit pharmacists, Park Davis and Company, who's, so I got back one there, there we go, who sent a memo asking his staff to contact Briggs and ask when a supply of this fruit can be obtained. The reference to cocaine was particularly tantalizing. Pharmacies were now well stocked with sedative drugs, such as bromides, chloral hydrate and morphine, but cocaine was, apart from caffeine and alcohol, the only central nervous stimulant on the market. It was Park Davis's current blockbuster. By 1886, they were the leading US supplier, marketing it enthusiastically in powders, sol solutions and lozenges as the most important therapeutic discovery of the age. Concerns about its addictive properties were, however, starting to tarnish its image, and Davis was seeking alternatives. Ever since its foundation in 1866, Davis had built the company through drug discovery and entrepreneurship. By 1874, their catalogue listed over 250 types of fluid extract, 300 different pills and dozens of solid extracts and elixirs. In 1876, they patented the laxative cascara, derived from a plant long used by the native people of the Pacific Northwest. Now they were dispatching researchers to Mexico, Fiji and South America in search of further miraculous vegetable drugs. They developed their discoveries for market by supplying prominent physicians with regular working bulletins, pamphlets on new plants and drugs, accompanied by samples and requests for feedback. Peyote was also brought to Park Davis's attention around this time by a Laredo dealer in ornamental cacti, 
Anna Nichols, whose nurseries boasted thousands of cactus specimens ready for shipment to the emerging domestic market. Nichols was one of the first commercial mail order cactus suppliers offering almost any cactus found in Mexico, as she said, to a clientele that became international after her display won a highest award at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. One of her Mexican traveling companions, she discovered in 1887, had sold 30,000 dried buttons of a cactus known as mezcal to a local trader, which were, as she wrote to Park Davis, being used by the Indians as a drink. She began supplying fresh specimens at five cents each to local Mexican customers who, they told her, used them to treat headaches. They pound and soak them in water, then strain and drink the water. They use the pulp left to bind any sort of sores. Park Davis found it difficult to square these wildly differing accounts. According to Briggs's reports of Indian use, mescal was a vision producing narcotic that induced a two day coma. According to his alarming self experiment, it was a violent poison that accelerated the heart rate to a terrifying degree. Anna Nichols' evidence, however, suggested a mild tonic and poultice. Its botanical taxonomy was equally unclear. According to some testimonies, it was a dried mushroom, a confusion that would persist into the 20th century. The terms mescal and peyote were used interchangeably by some and differentiated by others. It was unclear whether they referred to one particular cactus species or several, and whether these had different chemical properties. Mescal or muscal was a particularly unhelpful term since it was applied to three different plants, the peyote cactus, the strong spirit distilled from the agave plant, and the mescal bean, a bright red toxic seed used by various peoples of Mexico and the American Southwest as a medicine and a stimulus for vision quests. As a result, mescal was effectively a portmanteau term for local plant intoxicants, blurring the alcoholic and the toxic and the visionary. Park Davis forwarded some of the buttons supplied by Briggs to Harvard University, where Professor Serena Watson, curator of Harvard's Grey Herbarium, identified it conclusively as a cactus and tentatively as a member of the genus Anhelonium, of which five species were known in Mexico, though he suspected this might be a new one. They also sent some of Briggs's sample to the world's leading specialist in intoxicating drugs, Dr. Louis Levin at the University of Berlin, a charismatic figure who held packed lecture theatres spellbound with his magisterial weave of chemistry, mythology, botany, history and medicine. He had published studies of hundreds of drugs from opium to arrow poisons, cyanide to cannabis, antiseptics to poison gas and the drugs mentioned in Homer. The peyote samples arrived just as Levin was on the point of visiting the United States to study the opium scene in San Francisco's Chinatown. And he stopped in Detroit to visit Park Davis's grand factory. He marveled at the new age of pharmacy that was opening up in America. I had not expected such a magnitude and such a skilled exactitude of workmanship, he wrote back to Berlin. The manufacture of pharmaceutical preparations is worthy of the American genius. At the ever expanding manufacturing plant on the Detroit River, plant materials were extracted and pills were rolled. All preparations were subjected to chemical assay, making them the first plant drugs in medical history with a standardized dose. Products were methodically tested on animals and batch numbers on labels allowed every pill or droplets to be traced to its source. Levin was given further peyote samples and on his return to Germany extracted a mixture of alkaloids and resins from them. Somewhere within the mix must lurk a stimulant and vision producing drug, but the extract also seemed to contain powerful toxins. Frogs and pigeons given large doses passed from vomiting and twitching to muscular spasms and eventually coma. His initial findings published in the April 1888 issue of the Therapeutic Gazette identified an active principle he named anhalonine. Levin also passed some dried buttons over to a colleague at the Botanical Society of Berlin, who announced that despite its close kinship with the previously described anhalonium williamsii, this appeared to be a new species. 
He named it Anhelonium lewinii in Levin's honor. It was a famous discovery, the first known example of an intoxicating cactus. The Park Davis pharmacists, however, were not convinced by the identification, which would be struck down in 1894 when lewinii was judged to be identical with Williamsii. Levin was aware that more work was required to require to isolate the drug or drugs involved, but he claimed priority with an announcement that I expressly reserve to myself further investigations in this area. In the meantime, Park Davis went to market with a fluid extract, tincture of anhelonium, which they offered in their 1893 catalogue. It had, they claimed, a marked physiological action similar to strychnine, and it was recommended as a respiratory stimulant and cardiac tonic. At the same time, the other peyote story was unfolding. In February 1891, James Mooney of the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of Ethnology was in residence at the Bureau of Indian Affairs Agency at Anadarko, southwest Oklahoma, where the affairs of several tribes, including the Wichita, the Caddo, and some of the Kiowa were managed. Mooney had, in the course of his recent researches into the ghost dance, proved himself a uniquely trustworthy white interlocutor, and he was approached by a young Kiowa man who came to tell me in a guarded manner that his people intended to eat mescal that night at a camp about 10 miles up the Wachita River and would probably be willing to have me present. As dark fell, Mooney was met by two men, a Comanche and a Mexican who had been brought up by the Kiowa as a child captive. On their walk up river, he was told he must remove his hat when he entered the teepee and not to look at anyone while they were eating the seni as peyote was called in Kiowa. Eventually, they arrived at a copse beside the river where a teepee had been erected. As the door flap was drawn open, he saw a group of about 30 men, a mix of Kiowa, Comanche and Apache, seated in a circle around a central fire enclosed within a horseshoe of banked earth on which had been placed a large peyote button. At 10 o'clock, a master of ceremonies known as the Roadman rolled a smoke of tobacco in a dried corn shuck and offered an opening prayer before passing 12 dried buttons to each participant. They ate them, plucking the downy tuft from the center before carefully chewing and swallowing. At this point, a small water-filled drum and rattle were unveiled and passed around the group. Each participant in turn sang in their own language with full voices at the same time beating the drum and shaking the rattle with all the strength of their arms. This continued until midnight when the roadman blew an eagle bone whistle and water was passed around. Participants were allowed to leave the teepee to stretch their legs or relieve themselves. Few, however, do this as it's considered a sign of weakness. The singing and drumming resumed promptly and at one point in the dark hours that followed, the door flap was suddenly lifted and a man stepped in carrying in his arms an infant, a child sick almost to death. Mooney watched with profound emotion, the pathetic earnestness of the father as he watched the priests praying over his child, which seemed in stupor and made no sound, after which he left as silently as he entered. The songs and prayers continued through to first light when a group of women from the camp entered with water, bread, dried meat, sweetened corn and coffee. The ceremony ended with the roadman requesting Mooney that I should go back and tell the whites that the Indians had a religion of their own, which they loved. Mooney spent much of his subsequent career honoring this request, which went to the heart of his lifelong commitment to preserving the essence of Indian culture in a modern world, committed to its forced assimilation. He described the experience in these terms. One seems to be lifted out of the body and floating about in the air like a freed spirit. The fire takes on glorious shapes. The sacred mescal upon the crescent mound becomes alive and moves and talks, and you talk to it and it answers. You look around on your companions and they seem far away and unreal, yet you know they're close by your side. At times, the song and the drumbeat fill the teepee like a burst of thunder. And then the sound comes up from the ground and out of the air and is all around you like spirit whisperings. In the course of further peyote meetings, Mooney found out that the Kiowa had learned of the peyote religion from the Comanche, whom he believed to be among the earliest adopters of the teepee ceremony, 
though it seemed from the beginning to have been a pan-tribal affair. The Comanche sphere of control across the southern plains had been vast, extending at times well into Mexico and the cactus's natural habitat. But as with the horse of which they became undisputed masters, it seemed they had received the knowledge of peyote via intermediaries such as the Apache bands who had raided deep into peyote country before being forcibly settled in Oklahoma alongside the Comanche. The many Comanche, Apache and Kiowa tales of the origin of peyote all placed its discovery in the distant south. In November 1893, Mooney arrived at the military base of Fort Sill, the administrative center of the Comanche Apache Kiowa Reservation. It was intended as a cradle of civilization for the people regarded by white society as the wildest and most savage of all the Plains tribes, the last to be brought to heel. Sorry, I've jumped on one again there. There we go. But for a nomadic people such as the Comanche who had never planted a seed or conceived of land being owned, there was a little appeal in a lifetime of hard labor for vegetables that they barely considered food. They quickly became dependent on beef rations, but these were meager to begin with and pilfering by government employees and contractors who provided them meant that they were left languishing in near starvation. The Comanche leader, Quana Parker, that's uh, him second from the left kneeling, this photo taken by James Mooney. Quana Parker, who had made his name as an outlaw warrior in the days before forced captivity, proved remarkably adept at navigating this new world. He negotiated directly with the Texas ranchers who wanted to use the rich Comanche grasslands for pasture and watering and insisted on being paid directly by them rather than via the agency. By the time of Mooney's visits, this arrangement was bringing considerable income into the reservation and to Quana personally. He began to use his white surname, dress in Western suits with his long hair braided back and made several visits by train to Washington, where he eventually met President Roosevelt, who accepted a return invitation to visit him at his grand cattleman style house. Quana accepted the title Chief of the Comanches, a role that had never existed in their days of freedom, but allowed them to speak through him with one voice. Quana was a prominent advocate for the peyote religion, which had become established in the reservation after the Texas Railway opened. It was said that he'd first encountered peyote in 1884, when he was cured of it by it of a serious stomach injury. He may also have learned its rights from one of his wives, who was a Lipan Apache. Some histories credit him as the originator of the Plains peyote ceremony, and he was certainly one of its most effective proselytizers. But the peyote rite was no one's invention. It was a creation of all and none. Setting the ceremony at night and within a teepee was a response to the new strictures of forced captivity that included prohibitions on openly singing and dancing. The sacramental use of peyote was an innovation, but many of the ceremonial elements that surrounded it were of great antiquity. The form of the teepee circle, the water drum and gourd rattle, the sacred space purified with sage and cedar incense, the beaded feather fan and the eagle bone whistle were familiar to every Plains Indian. The federal government treated peyote from the beginning as a medical problem and an obstacle to Indian assimilation. In 1888, the trade was banned on the Fort Sill Reservation, but it was available at nearby trading posts and the clandestine nature of the teepee ceremony made it impossible to police. They keep it hid out like the whites do whiskey in Kansas, the exasperated new agent Charles Adams wrote in 1891. Quana stood his ground, insisting to the agency and to the missionary council that it was both a sacred tradition and a valuable medicine. In this latter capacity, it was used either with or without the accompanying ceremony, both as a general panacea and a specific for pneumonia, liver disease, diabetes, sores, and eye inflammations. For its adherents, mostly men of the younger generation, the peyote meeting was a microcosm of the old ways within the trauma of captivity, a way of maintaining their cultural identity in the face of shattered tribal structures, the removal of their children to boarding schools, and the destitution and alcoholism to which so many were reduced. It spread rapidly from Oklahoma across the Midwest and Rocky Mountain states 
despite being prohibited in many jurisdictions. In 1918, the threat of a federal ban on peyote prompted a pan-tribal association with a participation of James Mooney to incorporate themselves formally as a religion to claim freedom of worship under the US Constitution. They chose the name Native American Church and described peyote as their sacrament. By this time, peyote had yielded up its secrets to Western science. In 1897, the Leipzig chemist Arthur Hefter snatched the prize of discovery from Louis Levin, whose researches into anhalonine had made little progress. Hefter isolated the resins and alkaloids from the cactus and self-experimented with each in turn. The resins produced nausea but little psychoactive effect. With a dose of the alkaloids, he was rewarded with entoptic visions on his closed eyelids, violet and green spots that developed into patterns like oriental carpets and eventually into dazzling and ever-shifting landscapes and architectural forms. Dosing himself with five separate alkaloids in turn, Hefter established that these visions were produced by one in particular which, taking his cue from the common term mescal, he named mescaline. In 1919, in the laboratories of Vienna University, the biochemist Ernst Speit successfully synthesized mescaline sulfate, starting from an oil found in eucalyptus. He established that it was a phenethylamine related to ephedrine, for which he had also developed a synthesis. In 1920, Merck Pharmaceutical Company made mescaline available as a research chemical, and it was used extensively in neuroscience and psychiatry to study hallucinations and the optical and neural mechanisms that underlay them. Peyote, meanwhile, remained in the Western pharmacopoeia, but never established a successful application. In 1936, a tincture named Peyotil RD, sold by mail order from Geneva as a remedy for nervous conditions, attracted the attention of the League of Nations Advisory Committee on Traffic in Opium and Other Dangerous Drugs, who, on the basis of its hallucinatory effects and its prohibition on Indian reservations in the US, recommended that it should be limited to medical prescription. One of the leading enthusiasts for peyote as a medicine was the French doctor Alexandre Rouillet, who during the 1920s grew the cactus in the hills above the Côte d'Azur and marketed his own patent extract, Pan Peyotl. He had studied its use in indigenous healing and asked why it was esteemed in its homeland as a panacea while it struggled to find an application in Western medicine. For the Indians of Mexico and equally those of the prairie, he noted, illness does not have a physical cause. Peyote in Native American cultures held a magical power over disease. Its medical efficacy was one aspect of its power to render unseen forces visible, just as it warned of approaching enemies or evil influences and revealed the whereabouts of lost objects, it could unmask the hidden causes of sickness. These clairvoyant powers of peyote, Rouillet observed, were dismissed by doctors as superstition, but by the same token it was unreasonable to expect indigenous healing to translate obligingly into Western medicine. In the context of Western modernity, peyote had no spiritual power, merely a series of possible medical applications for which it was obliged to compete with other well-established drugs. Its medical properties were not illusory, but they were limited. It was doubtful, Rouillet concluded, that it could replace opium or hashish as a euphoric or bromine chloral and barbiturates as a nervous sedative or digitalis as a cardiac medicine. He recommended his own pan peyotl in doses of 0.4 grams as a caffeine-like stimulant remedy for fatigue, migraine and depression. The Native American church during this period expanded across the USA and beyond. In 1955, its umbrella association was renamed the Native American Church of North America to include the many chapters that had sprung up among the First Nations of Canada. There were and remain many variations among the different tribes and traditions, but the core ritual is recognizably the same as the one attended by James Mooney in 1891. 
It's a group ceremony in which, as witnessed by Mooney, individual healing rites are commonly included. The ceremony is regarded as especially potent against white men's diseases or diseases of maternity, of modernity, which include med mental distress, substance abuse and alcoholism. The role of peyote in indigenous healing has been described by Western medical anthropologists in terms of therapeutic implotment. It works in the ceremony to create a suggestible mental state in which participants can be immersed in a powerful mythic narrative deeply rooted in their culture. Peyote is conceived in this narrative as a teacher, benign and omniscient, and the ceremony is rich in symbols and metaphors that allow the patient a chance to review their life story and to choose a new direction. With the peyote button presiding on the altar, the central fire reaches up to the sky where the moon traces the course of the night, a guiding light from above. It's succeeded by the dawn of a new day, the gift of life and a fresh beginning. The singing, drumming and prayers harness the shared experience of the participants and connect them to the great spirit, God or nature. Peyote is both medicine and sacrament. It offers each participant its teaching, which in the case of those who are sick, includes insight into the cause of their condition and its cure. The ceremony is the beginning of a communal process that points the road to recovery, in which positive habits will be reinforced and healthy, unhealthy ones discouraged and health restored both to the sick individual and to the group as a whole. In 1956, the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, while researching the effects of mescaline at Weyburn Mental Hospital in Saskatchewan, was invited to a local meeting of the Cree chapter of the Native American church. Osmond, as is him here on the right, wrote that he found the ceremony extremely beautiful and it inspired him to initiate trials of mescaline and LSD for the treatment of alcoholism. He recognized the Native Americans as, quote, masters of symbol, ceremony and ritual. And he paid close attention to the settings of his own trials, priming the subjects with positive expectations, creating a relaxed, comfortable and non-clinical environment, introducing stimuli such as music and artworks. Using the new term he'd coined in conversation with Aldous Huxley that year, Osmond christened his method psychedelic therapy. The Indians, Osmond wrote, have been very skillful in constructing their ceremonies that it best meets their needs, but our needs are very different from theirs. As our two stories should make clear, indigenous therapeutics cannot be transposed wholesale into 21st century clinical practice. Western medicine has its own form of therapeutic implotment, which enshrines quite different practices and assumptions. The doctor or therapist, the central figure in Western medicine, has no equivalent in the Native American church. The roadman who conducts the ceremony is not an expert high status professional, but a facilitator. Their job is merely to ensure the ceremony is correctly conducted from which the healing proceeds organically. Unlike the confidential doctor patient transaction, the roadman performs any individual healings in full public view involving the other participants together with the sick individual. They, not the roadman, will be the ones to accompany the patient on the next stages of their healing journey. In the clinical model, the patient is a passive recipient of the medicine, which is administered as safely as possible and performs its function without any further ceremony. In the TP, the medicine creates the conditions for healing, but the patient's will and courage are central to the process. The all night ceremony is a tough physical ordeal and it's recognized as such. Risks are not to be avoided or minimized, but confronted and defeated. These differences are implicit in the term medicine and it's quite distinct meanings in Western and indigenous cultures. In the West, medicine usually refers to a drug, a chemical compound with bioactive properties. Modern notions of medicine are predicated on separating the physiological effects of the drug from, quote, extra pharmacological variables, such as expectations, settings, beliefs, and placebo responses, 
all such factors must be rigorously excluded before a medicine can be licensed. The indigenous definition of medicine is much more expansive. Like the original term pharmacon in classical Greece, medicine in Native American traditions describes a range of tools or techniques, whether using a healing plant or a magically charged object, a learned technique or an individual's particular gift. Peyote is medicine in this broader sense. It's seen as crude and re reductive to attribute its power simply to its biochemistry. Psychedelics may find new and valuable applications in the 21st century Western clinic, but eliciting their full healing potential demands a wider understanding of drug therapy and of medicine itself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Mike, for such incredibly informative and interesting talk. And let's move on to questions and answers. And I'll start with the most upvoted ones. Okay. So the first one, uh, there is a lot of good history here, and history focused almost exclusively on men. What do you know about the role of uh, women? Is it an absence of documentation? Are there reasons for the absence? It's an absence of documentation. Um, it's uh, at least, or the, or it's a, you know, it's a sign of my limitations uh, in that regard. Um, Anna Nichols, uh, I, I, you know, I was particularly interested in her as a cactologist because she's the only um, female cactologist in that first sort of generation of people who, you know, make. Uh, you know, cacti and sort of uh, cactus cultivation, a sort of domestic activity. I read around a lot around her, um, but yeah, in the um, in in the do the documentation the, the the documentation that I found is um, is very male dominated. And when I found a female character like that, I made as much of her as I could. But that's a great question, and uh, I, I hope we haven't. Uh, I hope this is not the final word. Uh, there is a question from uh, Ibrahim Gabriel. Uh, great talk, Mike. In your opinion, what do we hear? Why do we hear so little about mescaline in the modern psychedelic research, at least in comparison to psilocybin or other similar compounds? Yeah, it's interesting because in the first wave of psychedelic research in the 1950s, it was really all about mescaline and uh, LSD. But I think by the time we got to the end of that wave, LSD had really taken over, and I think um, uh, a lot of this is a, is a question of dosage. Uh, one gram of mescaline is about three doses. One gram of LSD is several thousand doses. Uh, so obviously LSD is much, much, much more economical. But also I think because it acted at such um, small doses, uh, it was more attractive, it was more interesting to neuroscientists because they figured that it must be tripping some very specific mechanism in the brain. Uh, the idea was that mescaline kind of flooded the brain, um, you know, with uh, different responses. LSD seemed uh, more promising for the things that they were looking for, which were like a chemical cause of schizophrenia and uh, uh, preoccupations in those days. So I think when psychedelic research started up again in the 21st century, um, Part of the problem was that mescaline, because it was around early, had also been scheduled and criminalized very early. So it was um, it was much easier to get a license to, um, you know, use something like ketamine that was already approved. And I think there was also a certain amount of PR involved. I mean, a lot of the people who started with um, psilocybin have said what was attractive about it was it wasn't a recognizable name from illicit drug culture. So I think mescaline by that point was not the top of everybody's list. Um, but I think, you know, um, Mexican ha uh, mescaline has, um, has, has unique properties and there are um, a couple of people who are now trying to start to work with it today and finally put it through FDA trials. Uh, I was very intrigued by your mention of mescaline's unique properties. What, what are the unique properties of mescaline? I guess um, one that makes it less attractive for clinical use is um, that it is, it's, it's so long lasting. Um, 
it's different. I mean, it's a different class of chemical from the other psychedelics. Um, so LSD and um, psilocybin and DMT are all tryptamines. Mescaline is a phenethylamine. Um, so you have to take it at um, higher doses. It takes longer to get through the blood brain barrier. But I think when it does, um, it gives you a much more embodied experience, my sense. Uh, and I think um, you find this in um, it's sort of uh, mirrored in indigenous practice as well, is that uh, it's something that's happening to the mind and the body together. So I think there's always a danger, uh, particularly with uh, Western subjects that um, other psychedelics can become very cerebral. People can become trapped in their heads and lose a sense of their bodies. I think um, uh, mescaline is kind of uh, is, is, is slightly different in that way. It takes hold of the body and the mind um, together. Uh, another question. Uh, how can we find more historical sources in the media, such as newspapers published in 1800s that document people's experiences using peyote? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think uh, it's also, this is another big, big distinction between Western and indigenous approaches. Uh, you notice that as soon as you have the first uh, Western experimenters, and I, I've sort of detailed them all in my book, and this is a big range of um, uh, scientists and philosophers and artists, um, immediately they become fascinated with the visual properties and um, the visions of mescaline and in writing about it and writing about their experience in the first person. I did this. I felt that I saw that. So there's a lot of that as soon as peyote comes into, uh, in, in, you know, in, in, into the hands of Westerners. Uh, I think what you notice by contrast in indigenous um, traditions um, is that people are much less inclined to talk about their experience and you know it's something that's seen as much more private and people ask a little more what would be your motivation for sharing this why do you want to lay your trip on everybody else so i think that um you know we have to it's it's two different types of history i think the indigenous history is culturally much richer um but it doesn't have those kind of individual testimonies that you can find uh, as soon as uh, peyote comes uh, becomes interesting uh, to western science and culture yeah, and some of the testimonies had s highly significant effect like all those huxley's book that was mm. really a turning point for modern psychedelic use in the west uh then yeah. the next Question, what is Mike's view on efforts to increase peyote introduction to the wild? Uh, yeah, it seems to me that um, peyote has, you know, is under really serious conservation pressures, um, both uh, in the States and in Mexico. And, um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of problems around it. And I think a lot of those would be resolved if uh, the um, if you know if 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 the supply was more abundant because the demand is just increasing uh in all kinds of ways from uh you know mexican uh unlicensed patent uh med medications on, on you know on the mexican side through to the sort of curiosity of psychedelic culture in the west so uh so yeah i think uh, i think i think the the key that we need to unlock um which is the key that everybody needs is uh something that increases the supply and increases um, the, the um, a, amount of uh, wild peyote that's growing. And another question from David Heldress. Uh, are you working on any new books? Uh, yes, I am writing another um, book at the moment, which is um, focused more around this period when peyote was first discovered by the West, but looking around that at all kinds of um, all kinds of other mind-altering drugs and um, I think this is a western tradition that we've forgotten we uh, you know uh, we assume that drugs have always been banned in the west and uh, you know we have no tradition of them and we have to look to non-western traditions but I think we've forgotten that around that time you know lots of scientists and artists and all kinds of figures were using all kinds of drugs for the kind of very much the kind of um, uh, mental, psychic and spiritual explorations that we're now rediscovering them for today.
Uh, Natalie Story is asking, uh, I'm also interested in the role of gender in early Piotr rights. Yeah, um, that's, um, that's something I can't, I mean, I, I kind of answered that as far as I can in the first one. Um, I, I, all I can do is echo that back. I'm also really interested in that, um, but I don't um, have anything authoritative that I can tell you about it uh, beyond what I've already mentioned. Uh, another question. Is it appropriate for Mike to speak more on the historical relationship between Piyote rites and other <laughs> ceremonies like Ghost Dance and the Sun Dance? Yes, I think I, I, I looked at that and um, I've written about it in the book. I think um, the Ghost Dance and the uh, um, Peyote meeting are quite intimately connected. Um, I kind of tried to tell the story through two different perspectives, um, James Mooney's and Quana Parker's, and they both arrived at the same position on this, that um, the ghost dance was something that was going to um, destroy their culture and the um, peyote um, religion was something that had the chance of uh, reviving it and sustaining it. So I think you can't understand uh, one without the other. I think, you know, the, uh, what happened after the ghost dance uh, and forced captivity on the reservations uh, was instrumental in defining the shape of the peyote right as it emerged. A uh, question from uh, Nick. Could you discuss the chemistry of mescaline and the potential entourage effect that might be present, specifically in the reference to the earlier question regarding its lacking role at the clinic? Yeah. Um, uh, mescaline is one of only, I mean, of, of, of many different uh, alkaloids in the peyote cactus. It has uh, a, a couple of dozen other alkaloids. Some of them have been uh, synthesized and are used in um, Western uh, science and medicine in other ways. Uh, there's also a different entourage in the Wachuma or the San Pedro. Uh, and, um, but I, uh, and, but my sense of, the, of, of them all, of the experience, is that what really determines the experience is not these little nuances of the chemistry so much as the setting. I mean, they, you know, it's the difference between um, taking, you know, either the cactus uh, or the um, mescaline chemical on your own is so different from uh, um, taking it in a ceremonial or communal context. And that, again, is so different from taking it in a clinic as part of an experiment. So uh, I think, um, yeah, there is, a, there is a difference, but I think the, uh, it, it's the context that's what you put around it that really makes the difference in the experience rather than the precise chemistry. Yeah, the certain setting, always, always so important. And the next question is from Veronica Gonzalez about currently a very controversial topic. Uh, what are the main dilemmas that we face if consumption and distribution is legal in the US, but not in Mexico? Do you have a proposal? Um, I think um, Shakruna and Bia are doing great work on this. Um, I've, and um, I think, uh, the, the, uh, you know, as we said before, all the problems really come down to um, the supply pressures and the fact that there isn't enough peyote for everybody um, who wants to use it. Uh, in the meantime, I guess whenever anybody um, in, uh, asks me in a Western context about their kind of interest and curiosity in this matter, I always point them towards um, the Wachuma uh, because um, Wachuma is so much, it's the opposite of peyote in so many ways. It grows so fast and it covers the Andes. You know, you can drive for days and just see forests of Wachuma in the mountains and you can plant it at home and weather peyote grows very, very slowly. The Wachuma grows really very fast. So uh, I think in a way, um, the solution uh, that nature has given us to the, uh, this uh, current bottleneck on the supply of peyote is that uh, there is also another cactus. And synthetic mescaline as well as another option. Uh, do you know who is doing the current mescaline research for human trials? 
Yeah, this is uh, a pharmaceutical company called Journey Colab. So uh, you can have a look at, at, at their at their website, and um, they're moving forward into uh, uh, in, into the sort of first stage FDA trials with synthetic masculine. Another question. Uh, forgive if this has been addressed. Might communicate with Native American elders communities who request that Westerners have peyote alone, uh, leave peyote alone, avoid it unless we are consuming it within their religion. Yes, uh, that's my advice as well. As I say, um, you know, there's um, uh, for people who are curious and want to explore, uh, I would I would recommend exploring the Wachuma, which also has. Um, not only masculine, it has uh, it has incredibly rich spiritual traditions of its own, and there's an enormous amount to learn from it. Uh, I've just been looking at uh, Michael Pollan's forthcoming book, and interestingly, this is his advice. He says, um, you know, if you want to be, you know, righteous and um, do right by peyote, then uh, the right way to use it is not to use it. Are there overlaps or differences you know of uh, between the use of peyote and San Pedro in sacred ceremonies? My sense is that the Native American church ceremony is uh, very different from um, the uh, Wachuma traditions. And I think that's partly because it was shaped, um, you know, in this period of forced captivity. So uh, it became something that was uh, done inside a teepee, so it could be done very privately. And it also took on some elements, I think, of the, um, uh, of, of, of the Christian um, missionaries and the uh, Presbyterian and uh, Protestant um, Christian structures around it. Uh, so it's much more contemplative. And I think um, uh, it's got some, um, Rather than having a, a shaman or anyone with spiritual power, it's very, very democratic. Everybody uh, is their own conscience. Everybody is their own priest. The roadman always very makes clear that you know these are not his special sacred um, objects. You know they're always passed around the circle. So it's got that um, very, de very democratic um, sense that I think is very is different from the more um, magical and shamanic um, uh, context in which uh, Wachuma tends to be used. Okay, and uh, we have the last question from John Cannon. Would you comment on the subtle split between Lakota Dakota sun dances where TP meetings go on all night at some dances, but some traditionists do not approve of mixing the two ceremonies? Yeah, I'm aware of the difference of opinion there, but I have no. That's uh, that I that that's not something that I would uh, um, I, I I would comment on. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it's a, it's it's a, it's a good question, um, but it's not something that I have any standing to speak to. Okay, that's that seems to be all the questions from the chat. Thank you so much for answering all the questions and oh, uh, your pleasure. presentation. Great questions. Thank you all very much indeed.